Now, what about the client who has meningitis? Are you familiar with the nursing assessment? What would be important to monitor? Let's start with a review. Meningitis is an inflammation of the outermost layer of the brain and spinal cord. It can be viral, called aseptic, bacterial, or rarely fungal. Viral meningitis is generally less serious than bacterial is. Risk factors for bacterial meningitis include intracranial surgery and other invasive intracranial procedures, skull fractures, penetrating head wounds, sinus and inner ear infections, and infections with Neisseria meningitidis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, or Haemophilus influenzae. Individuals who are immunocompromised and older adults who are also at risk. The risk factor for viral meningitis is infection. Viral meningitis typically follows a viral infection such as measles, mumps, herpes simplex, or herpes zoster. Are you aware of the mode of transmission of meningitis? It's respiratory. Clients who have meningitis are placed on isolation precautions per hospital policy because the infection is transmitted by the respiratory route. Individuals who have had close contact with a person who has meningococcal meningitis should receive prophylactic treatment with rifampin. Menomune is a vaccine that can be given to protect against meningococcal meningitis. Let's talk about the signs and symptoms. Meningeal irritation accounts for the classic signs and symptoms of meningitis. Headache, chills, and high fever, nuchal rigidity, that's stiffness of the neck, irritability, decreased level of consciousness, photophobia, and hypersensitivity. There are two very important signs that apply to bacterial meningitis only. First, Koenig sign. After the examiner flexes the client's hip and knee, the client cannot extend the leg completely. Second, Brzezinski's reflex. The client hip flexes when the examiner flexes the client's neck. What are some of the complications of meningitis? Increased ICP, seizures, syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, or SIADH, and bacteremia with septic emboli, disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, seizures, and hemiparesis. Let's talk about the diagnostic tools used when meningitis is suspected. If there is no indication of ICP, a lumbar puncture is done to obtain a CSF sample for analysis. With both bacterial and viral meningitis, white blood cells and protein are increased. With bacterial meningitis, the CSF fluid is cloudy, glucose is decreased, and cerebrospinal fluid pressure is elevated. Bacterial meningitis is confirmed by the presence of bacteria in the CSF. With viral meningitis, CSF is clear, glucose is normal, and cerebrospinal fluid pressure may or may not be elevated. Medical management is aimed at eradicating the causative organism, treating the symptoms, and preventing complications. Treatment includes antibiotics, anticonvulsants, antipyretics, and analgesics. Until CSF fluid culture and sensitivity results are available, a cephalosporin may be prescribed. If necessary, the order may be changed to a more appropriate antibacterial, antifungal, or antiviral agent. You do your nursing assessment in the following order. Monitor for the signs, symptoms, and complications we've reviewed. Do vital signs, neurologic checks, and vascular assessments every two to four hours. Vascular complications require additional attention. Septic emboli most often affect circulation to the hands. Nevertheless, you'd monitor temperature, pulse, color, and capillary refill in all extremities. Intake and output records will help you to detect water retention due to SIADH. Administer medications as prescribed for pain and for fever. Assessment and care of the client with increased intracranial pressure and seizures are crucial. If you would like to review this care, simply use your navigational prompts to take you to the section on head injury.